chapter twelve of cleopatra by georg ebers translated by mary j safford this librivox recording is in the public domain barine had been an hour in the palace the magnificently furnished room to which she was conducted was directly above the council chamber and sometimes in the silence of the night the voice of the queen or the loud cheers of men were distinctly heard barine listened without making the slightest effort to catch the meaning of the words which reached her ears she longed only for something to divert her thoughts from the deep and bitter emotion which filled her soul ay she was roused to fury and yet she felt how completely this passionate resentment contradicted her whole nature true the shameless conduct of philostratus during their married life had often stirred the inmost depths of her placid kindly spirit and afterwards his brother alexis had come to drive her by his disgraceful proposals to the verge of despair rage was added to the passionate agitation of her soul and for this she had cause to rejoice but for this mighty resentment during the time of struggle she might have perhaps succumbed from sheer weariness and the yearning desire to rest at last at last she and her friends by means of great sacrifices had succeeded in releasing her from these tortures philostratus's consent to liberate her was purchased alexis's persecution had ceased long before he had first been sent away as envoy by his patron antony and afterwards been compelled to accompany him to the war how she had enjoyed the peaceful days in her mother's house how quickly the bright cheerfulness which she had supposed lost had returned to her soul and to-day fate had blessed her with the greatest happiness life had ever offered true she had had only a few brief hours in which to enjoy it for the attack of the unbridled boys and the wound inflicted upon her lover had cast a heavy shadow on her bliss her mother had again proved to be in the right when she so confidently predicted a second misfortune which would follow the first only too soon Marine had been torn at midnight from her peaceful home and her wounded lover's bedside this was done by the queen's command and full of angry excitement she said to herself that the men were right who cursed tyranny because it transformed free human beings into characterless chattels there could be nothing good awaiting her that was proved by the messengers whom cleopatra had sent to summon her at this unprecedented hour they were her worst enemies iris who desired to wed her lover dion had told her so after the assault and alexis whose suit she had rejected in a way which a man never forgives she had already learned iris's feelings the slender figure with the narrow head long delicate nose small chin and pointed fingers seemed to her like a long sharp thorn this strange comparison had entered her head as iris stood rigidly erect reading aloud in a shrill high voice the queen's command everything about this hard cold face appeared as sharp as a sting and ready to destroy her her removal from her mother's house to the royal palace had been swift and simple after the attack of which she saw little because overpowered by fear and horror she closed her eyes she had driven home with her lover where the leech had bandaged his injuries and berenike had quickly and carefully transformed her own sleeping chamber into a sick room barine after changing her dress did not leave dion's side she had attired herself carefully for she knew his delight in outward adornment when she returned from her grandparents before sunset she was alone with him and he kissing her arm had murmured that wherever the greek tongue was spoken there was not one more beautiful the gem was worthy of its loveliness so she had opened her baggage to take out the circlet which antony had given and it again enclasped her arm when she entered the sick-room 
because dion had told her that he deemed her fairest in the simple white robe she had worn a few days before when there were no guests save himself and gorgias and she had sung until after midnight his favourite songs as though all were intended for him alone her choice had fallen upon this garment and she rejoiced that she had worn it the wounded man's eyes rested upon her so joyously when she sat down opposite to him the physician had forbidden him to talk and urged him to sleep if possible so barine only held his hand in silence whispering whenever he opened his eyes a tender word of love and encouragement she had remained with him for hours leaving her place at his side merely to give him his medicine or with her mother's aid place poultices on his wounds when his manly face was distorted by suffering she shared his pain but during most of the time a calm pleasant sense of happiness pervaded her mind she felt safe and sheltered in the possession of the man whom she loved though fully aware of the perils which threatened him and perhaps her also but the assurance of his love completely filled her heart and cast every care entirely into the shade many men had seemed estimable and agreeable a few even desirable husbands but dion was the first to awaken love in her ardent but by no means passionate soul she regarded the experiences of the past few days as a beautiful miracle how she had yearned and pined until the most fervent desire of her heart was fulfilled now dion had offered her his love and nothing could rob her of it gorgias and the sons of her uncle arius had disturbed her a short time after they had gone with a good report berenike had entreated her daughter to lie down and let her take her place but barine would not leave her lover's couch and had just loosed her hair to brush it again and fasten the thick fair braids around her head when two hours after midnight some one knocked loudly on the window shutters berenike was in the act of removing the poultice so barine herself went into the atrium to wake the doorkeeper but the old man was not asleep and had anticipated her she recognized with a low cry of terror the first person who entered the lighted vestibule alexis iris followed her head closely muffled for the storm was still howling through the streets last of all a lantern-bearer crossed the threshold the syrian saluted the startled young beauty with a formal bow but iris without a greeting or even a single word of preparation delivered the queen's command and then read aloud by the light of the lantern what cleopatra had scrawled upon the wax tablet when barine pallid and scarcely able to control her emotion requested the messengers who had arrived at so late an hour to enter in order to give her time to prepare for the night drive and take leave of her mother iris vouchsafed no reply but as if she had the right to rule the house merely ordered the doorkeeper to bring his mistress's cloak without delay while the old man with trembling knees moved away iris asked if the wounded dion was in the dwelling and barine her self-control restored by the question answered with repellent pride that the queen's orders did not command her to submit to an examination in her own house iris shrugged her shoulders and said sneeringly to alexis in truth i asked too much one who attracts so many men of all ages can scarcely be expected to know the abode of each individual the heart has a faithful memory replied the syrian in a tone of correction but iris echoed contemptuously the heart then all were silent until instead of the doorkeeper berenike herself came hurrying in bringing the cloak with pallid face and bloodless lips she wrapped it around her daughter's shoulders whispering amid floods of tears almost inaudible words of love and encouragement which iris interrupted by requesting barine to follow her to the carriage the mother and daughter embraced and kissed each other then the closed equipage bore the persecuted woman through the storm and darkness to lochias not a word was exchanged between barine and the queen's messengers until they reached the room where the former was to await cleopatra 
but here iris again endeavoured to induce her to speak at the first question however barine answered that she had no information to give the room was as bright as if it were noonday though the lights flickered constantly for the wind found its way through the thin shutters closing the windows on both sides of the corner room and a strong cold draught swept in barine wrapped her cloak more closely around her the storm which howled about the sea washed palace harmonized with the vehement agitation of her soul whether she had looked within or without there was nothing which could have soothed her save the assurance of being loved an assurance that held fear at bay now indignation prevented dread from overpowering her yet calm consideration could not fail to show her that danger threatened on every hand the very manner in which iris and alexis whispered together without heeding her presence boded peril for courtiers show such contempt only to those whom they know are threatened with the indifference or resentment of the sovereign barine during her married life with a man devoid of all delicacy of feeling and with a disposition as evil as his tongue was ready had learned to endure many things which were hard to bear yet when after a remark from iris evidently concerning her she heard alexis laugh she was compelled to exert the utmost self-restraint to avoid telling her enemy how utterly she despised the cowardly cruelty of her conduct but she succeeded in keeping silent still the painful constraint she imposed on herself must find vent in some way and as the tortured anguish of her soul reached its height large tears rolled down her cheeks these too were noticed by her enemy and made the target of her wit but this time the sarcasm failed to produce its effect upon the syrian for instead of laughing he grew grave and whispered something which seemed to barine a reproof or a warning iris's reply was merely a contemptuous shrug of the shoulders barine had noticed long before that her mother in her fear and bewilderment had brought her own cloak instead of her daughter's and this circumstance also did not seem to her foe too trivial for a sneer but the childish insolence that seemed to have taken possession of one who usually by no means lacked dignity was merely the mask beneath which she concealed her own suffering a grave motive was the source of the mirth by which she affected to be moved at the sight of her enemy's cloak the grey ill-fitting garment disfigured barine and she desired that the queen should feel confident of surpassing her rival even in outward charms no one not even cleopatra could dispense with a protecting wrap in this cold draught and nothing suited her better than the purple mantle in whose delicate woollen fabric black and gold dragons and griffins were embroidered iris had taken care that it lay ready barine could not fail to appear like a beggar in comparison though alexis said that her blue kerchief was marvellously becoming he was a base-minded voluptuary who aided by rich gifts of mind and wide knowledge had shunned no means of ingratiating himself with antony the most lavish of patrons the repulse which this man accustomed to success had received from barine had been hard to forget yet he did not resign the hope of winning her never had she seemed more desirable than in her touching weakness even base natures are averse to witnessing the torture of the defenceless and when iris had aimed another poisoned shaft at her he ventured at the risk of vexing his ally to say under his breath condemned criminals are usually granted before their end a favourite dish i have no cause to wish barine anything good but i would not grudge that you on the contrary seem to delight in pouring wormwood on her last mouthful certainly she answered her eyes sparkling brightly malice is the purest of pleasures at least to me when exercised on this woman the syrian with a strange smile held out his hand saying keep your good will towards me iris because she retorted with a sneer evil may follow my enmity i think so too i am not especially sensitive concerning myself but whoever dares 
here she raised her voice to harm one whom i just listen to the cheers how she carries all hearts with her though fate had made her a beggar she would still be peerless among women she is like the sun the clouds which intrude upon her pathway of radiance are consumed and disappear while uttering the last sentence she had turned towards barine whose ear the sharp voice again pierced like a thorn as she commanded her to prepare for the examination almost at the same moment the door caught by the wind closed with a loud bang the introducer had opened it and after a hasty glance exclaimed the audience will not be given in this meeting-place for all the winds of heaven her majesty desires to receive her late visitor in the hall of shells with these words he bowed courteously to barine and ushered her and her two companions through several corridors and apartments into a well-heated anteroom here even the windows were thoroughly protected from the storm several bodyguards and pages belonging to the corps of the royal boys stood waiting to receive them this is comfortable said alexis turning to iris was the winter we have just experienced intended to fill us with twofold gratitude for the delights of the mild spring in this blessed room perhaps so she answered sullenly and then added in a low tone here at lochias the seasons do not follow their usual course they change according to the pleasure of the supreme will instead of four the egyptians as you know have but three in the palaces on the nile they are countless what is the meaning of this sudden entry of summer winter would have pleased me better the queen iris knew not why had changed her arrangements for barine's reception this vexed her and her features assumed a gloomy threatening expression as the young beauty casting aside her cloak and kerchief stood awaiting cleopatra in a white robe of fine material and perfect fit the thick fair braids wound simply around her shapely head gave her an appearance of almost childish youth and the sight made iris feel as if she and cleopatra also were outwitted in the dimly lighted atrium of the house near the paneum garden she had noticed only that barine wore something white had it been merely a night robe so much the better but she might have appeared in her present garb at the festival of isis the most careful deliberation could have selected nothing more suitable or becoming and did this vain woman go to rest with costly gold ornaments else how did the circlet chance to be on her arm each of cleopatra's charms seemed to iris who knew them all like a valuable possession of her own to see even the least of them surpassed by another vexed her and to behold in yonder woman a form which she could not deny was no less beautiful enraged nay pierced her to the heart since she had known that because of barine she could hope for nothing more from the man to whose love she believed she possessed a claim dating from their childhood she had hated the young beauty and now to the many things which contributed to increase her hostile mood was added the disagreeable consciousness that during the last few hours she had treated her contemptibly had she only seen earlier what her foe's cloak concealed she would have found means to give her a different appearance but she must remain as she was for charmian had already entered other hours however would follow and if the next did not decide the fate of the woman whom she hated future ones should for this purpose she did not need the aid of charmian her uncle archibius's sister who had hitherto been a beloved associate and maternal friend but what had happened iris fancied that her pleasant features wore a repellent expression which she had never seen before was this also the singer's fault and what was the cause the older woman's manner decided the question whether she should still bestow upon her returned relative the love of a grateful niece no she would no longer put any restraint upon herself charmian should feel that she iris considered any favour shown to her foe an insult 
to work against her secretly was not in her nature she had courage to show an enemy her aversion and she did not fear charmian enough to pursue a different course she knew that the artist leonax barine's father had been charmian's lover but this did not justify her favouring the woman who had robbed her niece of the heart of the man whom she as charmian knew had loved from childhood charmian had just had a long conversation with her brother and had also learned in the palace that barine had been summoned to the queen's presence in the middle of the night so firmly persuaded that evil was intended to the young woman who had already passed through so many agitating scenes of joy and sorrow she entered the waiting-room and her pleasant though no longer youthful face framed in smooth grey hair was greeted by barine as the shipwrecked mariner hails the sight of land all the emotions which had darkened and embittered her soul were soothed she hastened towards her friend's sister as a frightened child seeks its mother and charmian perceived what was stirring in her heart it would not do under existing circumstances to kiss her in the palace but she drew leonax's daughter towards her to show iris that she was ready to extend a protecting hand over the persecuted woman but barine gazed at her with pleading glances beseeching aid whispering amid her tears help me charmian she has tortured insulted humiliated me with looks and words so cruelly so spitefully help me i can bear no more charmian shook her kind head and urged her in a whisper to calm herself she had robbed iris of her lover she should remember that cost what it might she must not shed another tear the queen was gracious she charmian would aid her everything would depend on showing herself to cleopatra as she was not as slander represented her she must answer her as she would archibius or herself the kindly woman as she spoke stroked her brow and eyes with maternal tenderness and barine felt as if goodness itself had quelled the tempest in her soul she gazed around her as though roused from a troubled dream and now for the first time perceived the richly adorned room in which she stood the admiring glances of the boys in the macedonian corps of pages and the bright fire blazing cheerily on the hearth the howling of the storm increased the pleasant sense of being under a firm roof and iris who had whispered to the introducer at the door no longer seemed like a sharp thorn or a spiteful demon but a woman by no means destitute of charm who repulsed her but on whom she had inflicted the keenest pang a woman's heart can suffer then she again thought of her wounded lover at home and remembered that whatever might happen his heart did not belong to iris but to her alone lastly she recalled archibius's description of cleopatra's childhood and this remembrance was followed by the conviction that the omnipotent sovereign would be neither cruel nor unjust and that it would depend upon herself to win her favour charmian too was the queen's confidante and if the manner of iris and alexis had alarmed her charmian's might well inspire confidence all these thoughts darted through her brain with the speed of lightning only a brief time for consideration remained for even as she bowed her head on the bosom of her friend the introducer entered the room crying her illustrious majesty will expect those whom she summoned in a few minutes soon after a chamberlain appeared waving a fan of ostrich feathers and preceded by the court official they passed through several brilliantly lighted richly furnished rooms barine again breathed freely and moved with head erect and when the wide lofty folding doors of ebony against whose deep black surface the inlaid figures of tritons mermaids shells fish and sea monsters were sharply relieved she beheld a glittering magnificent scene for the hall which cleopatra had chosen for her reception was completely covered with various marine forms from the shells to coral and starfish a wide lofty structure composed of masses of stalactites and unhewn blocks of stone formed a deep grotto at the end of the hall whence peered the gigantic head of a monster whose open jaws formed the fireplace of the chimney 
logs of fragrant arabian wood were blazing brightly on the hearth and the dragon's ruby glass eyes diffused a red light through the apartment which blended with the rays of the white and pink lamps in the shape of lotus flowers fastened among gold and silver tendrils and groups of sedges on the walls and ceiling filling the spacious apartment with the soft light whose roseate hue was specially becoming to cleopatra's waxen complexion several stewards and cup-bearers the master of the hunt chamberlains female attendants eunuchs and other court officials were awaiting the queen and pages who belonged to the macedonian cadet corps of royal boys stood sleepily with drooping heads around the small throne of gold coral and amber which placed opposite to the chimney awaited the sovereign barine had already seen this magnificent hall and others still more beautiful in the sebasteum and the splendour therefore neither excited nor abashed her only she would fain have avoided the numerous train of courtiers could it be cleopatra's intention to question her before the eyes of all these men women and boys she no longer felt afraid but her heart still throbbed quickly it had beat in the same way in her girlhood when she was asked to sing in the presence of strangers at last she heard doors open and an invisible hand parted the heavy curtains at her right she expected to see the regent the keeper of the seal and the whole brilliantly adorned train of attendants who always surrounded the queen on formal occasions enter the magnificent hall else why had it been selected as the scene of this nocturnal trial but what was this while she was still recalling the display at the adonis festival the curtains began to close again the courtiers around the throne straightened their bowed figures the pages forgot their fatigue and all joined in the greek salutation of welcome and the life happiness health with which the egyptians greeted their sovereign the woman of middle height who now appeared before the curtain and who as she crossed the wide hall alone and undetended seemed to barine even smaller than when surrounded by the gay throng at the adonis festival must be the queen ay it was she iris was already standing by her side and charmian was approaching with the introducer the women rendered her various little services thus iris took from her shoulders the purple mantle with its embroidery of black and gold dragons what an exquisite masterpiece of the loom it must be all the dangers against which she must defend herself flashed swiftly through barine's mind yet for an instant she felt the foolish feminine desire to see and handle the costly mantle but iris had already laid it on the arm of one of the waiting maids and cleopatra now glanced around her and with a youthful elastic step approached the throne once more the feeling of timidity which she had had in her girlhood overpowered barine but with it came the memory of the garden of epicurus and archibius's assurance that she too would have left the queen with her heart overflowing with warm enthusiasm had not a disturbing influence interposed between them yet had this disturbing influence really existed no it was created solely by cleopatra's jealous imagination if she would only permit her to speak freely now she should hear that antony cared as little for her as she barine for the boy caesarion what prevented her from confessing that her heart was another's iris had no one to blame save herself if she spoke the truth pitilessly in her presence cleopatra now turned to the introducer waving her hand towards the throne and those who surrounded it ay she was indeed beautiful how bright and clear was the light of her large eyes in spite of the harassing days through which she had passed and the present night of watching cleopatra's heart was still elated by the reception of her bold idea of escape and she approached barine with gentler feelings and intentions she had chosen a pleasanter room for the interview than the one iris had selected she desired a special environment to suit each mood and as soon as she saw the group of courtiers who surrounded the throne she ordered their dismissal 
the introducer to carry out the usual ceremonial had commanded their presence in the audience chamber but their attendance had given the meeting a form which was now distasteful to the queen she wished to question not to condemn at so happy an hour it was a necessity of her nature to be gracious perhaps she had been unduly anxious concerning this singer it even seemed probable for a man who loved her like antony could scarcely yearn for the favour of another woman this view had been freshly confirmed by a brief conversation with the chief inspector of sacrifices an estimable old man who after hearing how antony had hurried in pursuit of her at actium raised his eyes and hands as if transported with rapture exclaiming unhappy queen yet happiest of women no one was ever so ardently beloved and when the tale is told of the noble trojan who endured such sore sufferings for a woman's sake future generations will laud the woman whose resistless spell constrained the greatest man of his day the hero of heroes to cast aside victory fame and the hope of the world's sovereignty as mere worthless rubbish posterity whose verdict she dreaded this wise old reader of the future was right must extol her as the most fervently beloved the most desirable of women and mark antony even had the magic power of nectanibus's goblet forced him to follow her and to leave the battle there still remained his will a copy of which received from rome zeno the keeper of the seal had showed to her at the close of the council wherever he might die so ran the words he desired to be buried by the side of cleopatra octavianus had wrested it from the vestal virgins to whose care it had been entrusted in order to fill the hearts of roman citizens and matrons with indignation against his foe the plot had succeeded but the document had reminded cleopatra that her heart had given this man the first of its flowers that love for him had been the sunshine of her life so with head erect she had crossed the threshold where she was to meet the woman who had ventured to sow tares in her garden she intended to devote only a short time to the interview which she anticipated with the satisfaction of the strong who are confident of victory as she approached the throne her train left the hall the only persons who remained were charmian iris zeno the keeper of the seal and the introducer cleopatra cast a rapid glance at the throne to which an obsequious gesture of the courtier's hand invited her but she remained standing gazing keenly at barine was it the coloured rays from the ruby eyes of the dragon in the fireplace which shed the roseate glow on cleopatra's cheeks it certainly enhanced the beauty of a face now only too frequently pallid and colourless when rouge did not lend its aid but barine understood archibius's ardent admiration for this rare woman when cleopatra with a faint smile requested her to approach nothing more winning could be imagined than the frank kindness wholly untinged by condescending pride of this powerful sovereign the less barine had expected such a reception the more deeply it moved her nay her eyes grew dim with grateful emotion which lent them so beautiful a lustre she looked so lovely in her glad surprise that cleopatra thought the months which had elapsed since her first meeting with the singer had enhanced her charms and how young she was the queen swiftly computed the years which barine must have lived as the wife of philostratus and afterwards as the attractive mistress of a hospitable house and found it difficult to reconcile the appearance of this blooming young creature with the result of the calculation she was surprised too to note the aristocratic bearing whose possession no one could deny the artist's daughter this was apparent even in her dress yet iris had roused her in the middle of the night and certainly had given her no time for personal adornment she had expected lack of refinement and boldness in the woman who was said to have attracted so many men but even the most bitter prejudice could have detected no trace of it on the contrary the embarrassment which she could not yet wholly subdue lent her an air of girlish timidity 
all in all barine was a charming creature who bewitched men by her vivacity her grace and her exquisite voice not by coquetry and pertness that she possessed unusual mental endowments cleopatra did not believe barine had only one advantage over her youth time had not yet robbed the former of a single charm while from the queen he had wrested many their number was known only to herself and her confidants but at this hour she did not miss them barine with a low modest bow advanced towards the queen who commenced the conversation by graciously apologizing for the late hour at which she had summoned her but she added you belong to the ranks of the nightingales who during the night most readily and exquisitely reveal to us what stirs their hearts barine gazed silently at the floor a moment and when she raised her eyes her voice was faint and timid i sing it is true your majesty but i have nothing else in common with the birds the wings which when a child bore me wherever i desired have lost their strength they do not wholly refuse their service but they now require favourable hours to move i should not have expected that in the time of your youth your most beautiful possession replied the queen yet it is well i too how long ago it seems was a child and my imagination outstripped even the flight of the eagle it could dare the risk unpunished now whoever has reached mature life is wise to let these wings remain idle the mortal who ventures to use them may easily approach too near the sun and like icarus the wax will melt from his pinions let me tell you this to the child the gift of imagination is nourishing bread in later years we need it only as salt as spice as stimulating wine doubtless it points out many paths and shows us their end but of a hundred rambles to which it summons him scarcely one pleases the mature man no troublesome parasite is more persistently and sharply rebuffed who can blame the ill-treated friend if it is less ready to serve us as the years go on the wise man will keep his ears ever open but rarely lend it his active hand to banish it from life is to deprive the plant of blossoms the rose of its fragrance the sky of its stars i have often said the same things to myself though in a less clear and beautiful form when life has been darkened replied barine with a faint blush for she felt that these words were doubtless intended to warn her against cherishing too aspiring wishes but your majesty here also the gods place you the great queen far above us we should often find existence bare indeed but for the fancy which endows us with imaginary possessions you have the power to secure a thousand things which to us common mortals only the gift of imagination pictures as attainable you believe that happiness is like wealth and that the happiest person is the one who receives the largest number of the gifts of fortune answered the queen the contrary i think can be easily proved the maxim that the more we have the less we need desire is also false though in this world there are only a certain number of desirable things he who already possesses one of ten solidi which are to be divided ought really to desire only nine and therefore would be poorer by a wish than another who has none true it cannot be denied that the gods have burdened or endowed me with a greater number of perishable gifts than you and many others you seem to set a high value upon them doubtless there may be one or another which you could appropriate only by the aid of the imagination may i ask which seems to you the most desirable spare me the choice i beseech you replied barine in an embarrassed tone i need nothing from your treasures and as for the other possessions i lack many things but it is uncertain how the noblest and highest gifts in the possession of the marvellously endowed favourite of the gods would suit the small commonplace ones i call mine and i know not a sensible doubt interrupted the queen the lame man who desired a horse obtained one and on his first ride broke his neck 
the only blessing the highest of all which surely bestows happiness can neither be given away nor transferred from one to another he who has gained it may be robbed of it the next moment the last sentence had fallen from the queen's lips slowly and thoughtfully but barine remembering archibius's tale said modestly you are thinking of the chief good mentioned by epicurus perfect peace of mind cleopatra's eyes sparkled with a brighter light as she asked eagerly do you the granddaughter of a philosopher know the system of the master very superficially your majesty my intellect is far inferior to yours it is difficult for me thoroughly to comprehend all the details of any system of philosophy yet you have attempted it others endeavoured to introduce me into the doctrines of the stoics i have forgotten most of what i learned only one thing lingered in my memory and i know why because it pleased me and that was the wise law of living according to the dictates of our own natures the command to shun everything contradictory to the simple fundamental traits of our own characters pleased me and wherever i saw affectation artificiality and mannerism i was repelled while from my grandfather's teaching i drew the principle that i could do nothing better than to remain so far as life would permit what i had been as a child ere i had heard the first word of philosophy or felt the constraint which society and its forms impose so the system of the stoics leads to this end also cried the queen gaily and turning to the companion of her own studies she added did you hear charmian if we had only succeeded in perceiving the wisdom and calm purposeful order of existence which the stoics amid so much that is perverse unhealthy and provocative of contradiction nevertheless set above everything else how can i in order to live wisely imitate nature when in her being and action i encounter so much that is contradictory to my human reason which is a part of the divine here she hesitated and the expression of her face suddenly changed she had advanced close to barine and while standing directly in front of her her eyes had rested on the gem which adorned her arm above the elbow was it this which agitated cleopatra so violently that her voice lost its bewitching melody as she went on in a harsh angry tone so that is the source of all this misfortune even as a child i detested that sort of arbitrary judgment which passes under the mask of stern morality there is an example do you hear the howling of the storm in human nature as well as in the material world there are tempests and volcanoes which bring destruction and if the original character of any individual is full of such devastating forces like the neighbourhood of vesuvius or etna the goal to which his impulses would lead him is clearly visible i the stoic is not allowed to destroy the harmony and order of things in existence any more than to disturb those which are established by the state but to follow our natural impulses wherever they lead us is so perilous a venture that whoever has the power to fix a limit to it betimes is in duty bound to do so this power is mine and i will use it then with iron severity she asked as it seems to be one of the demands of your nature woman to allure and kindle the hearts of all who bear the name of man even though they have not yet donned the garb of the ephebi so too you seem to appear to delight in idle ornaments or and as she spoke she touched barine's shoulder or why should you wear during the hours of slumber that circlet on your arm barine had watched with increasing anxiety the marked change in the manner and language of the queen she now beheld a repetition of what she had experienced at the adonis festival but this time she knew what had roused cleopatra's jealousy she barine wore on her arm a gift from antony with pallid face she strove to find a fitting answer but ere she could do so iris advanced to the side of the incensed queen saying that circlet is the counterpart of the one 
your august husband bestowed upon you the singers must also be a gift from mark antony like every one else in the world she deems the noble imperator the greatest man of his day who can blame her for prizing it so highly that she does not remove it even while she sleeps again barine felt as if a thorn had pierced her but though the resentment which she had previously experienced once more surged hotly within her heart she forced herself to maintain seemly external composure and struggled for some word in answer but she found none suitable and remained silent she had told the truth from early youth she had followed the impulses of her own nature without heeding the opinion of mortals as the teachings of the stoics directed and she had been allowed to do so because this nature was pure truthful alive to the beautiful and moreover free from those unbridled volcanic impulses to which the queen alluded the cheerful patience of her soul had found ample satisfaction in the cultivation of her art and in social intercourse with men who permitted her to share their own intellectual life to-day she had learned that the first great passion of her heart had met with a response now she was bound to her lover and knew herself to be pure and guiltless far better entitled to demand respect from sterner judges of morality than the woman who condemned her or the spiteful iris who had not ceased to offer her love to dion the sorrowful feeling of being misunderstood and unjustly condemned mingled with fear of the terrible fate to which she might be sentenced by the omnipotent sovereign whose clear intellect was clouded by jealousy and the resentment of a mother's wounded heart paralyzed her tongue besides she was confused by the angry emotion which the sight of iris awakened twice thrice she strove to utter a few words of explanation defence but her voice refused to obey her will when charmian at last approached to encourage her it was too late the indignant queen had turned away exclaiming to iris let her be taken back to lochias her guilt is proved but it does not become the injured person the accuser to award the punishment this must be left to the judges before whom we will bring her then barine once more recovered the power of speech how dared cleopatra assert that she was convicted of a crime without hearing her defence as surely as she felt her own innocence she must succeed in proving it and with this consciousness she cried out to the queen in a tone of touching entreaty o oh, your majesty do not leave me without hearing me as truly as i believe in your justice i can ask you to listen to me once more do not give me up to the woman who hates me because the man whom she here cleopatra interrupted her royal dignity forbade her to hear one woman's jealous accusation of another but with the subtle discernment with which women penetrate one another's moods she heard in barine's piteous appeal a sincere conviction that she was too severely condemned doubtless she also had reason to believe in iris's hate and cleopatra knew how mercilessly she pursued those who had incurred her displeasure she had rejected and still shuddered at her advice to remove the singer from her path for an inner voice warned her not to burden her soul now with a fresh crime which would disturb its peace besides she had at first been much attracted by this charming winning creature but the irritating thought that antony had bestowed the same gift upon the sovereign and the artist's daughter still so incensed her that it taxed to the utmost her graciousness and self-control as without addressing any special person she exclaimed glancing back into the hall this examination will be followed by another when the time comes the accused must appear before the judges therefore she must remain at lochias and in custody it is my will that no harm befalls her you are her friend charmian i will place her in your charge only here she raised her voice on pain of my anger do not allow her by any possibility to leave the palace even for a moment or to hold intercourse with any person save yourself 
with these words she passed out of the hall and went into her own apartments she had turned the night into day not only to dispatch speedily matters which seemed to her to permit of no delay but even more because since the battle of actium she dreaded the restless hours upon her lonely couch they seemed endless and though before she had remembered with pleasure the unprecedented display and magnificence with which she had surrounded her love life with antony she now in these hours reproached herself for having foolishly squandered the wealth of her people the present appeared unbearable and from the future a host of black cares pressed upon her the following days were overcrowded with business details half of her nights were spent in the observatory she had not asked again for barine on the fifth night she permitted alexis to conduct her once more to the little observatory which had been erected for her father at lochias and antony's favourite knew how to prove that a star which had long threatened her planet was that of the woman whom she seemed to have forgotten as completely as she had ignored his former warning against this very foe the queen denied this but alexis eagerly continued the night after your return home your kindness was again displayed in its inexhaustible and to us less noble souls incomprehensible wealth deeply agitated we watched during the memorable examination the touching spectacle of the greatest heart making itself the standard by which to measure what is petty and ignoble but ere the second trial takes place the wanderers above who know the future bid me warn you once more for that woman's every look was calculated every word had its fixed purpose every tone of her voice was intended to produce a certain effect whatever she said or may yet say had no other design than to deceive my royal mistress as yet there have been no definite questions and answer but you will have her examined and then what may she not make of the story of mark antony barine and the two armlets perhaps it will be a masterpiece do you know its real history asked cleopatra clasping her fingers more closely around the pencil in her hand if i did replied alexis smiling significantly the receiver of stolen goods should not betray the thief not even if the person who has been robbed the queen commands you to give up the dishonestly acquired possession unfortunately even then i should be forced to withhold obedience for consider my royal mistress there are but two great luminaries around which my dark life revolves shall i betray the moon when i am sure of gaining nothing thereby save to dim the warm light of the sun that means that your revelations would wound me the sun unless your lofty soul is too great to be reached by shadows which surround less noble women with an atmosphere of indescribable torture do you intend to render your words more attractive by the veil with which you shroud them it is transparent and dims the vision very little my soul you think should be free from jealousy and the other weaknesses of my sex there you are mistaken i am a woman and wish to remain one as terence's creamy says he is a human being and nothing human is unknown to him i do not hesitate to confess all feminine frailties anubis told me of a queen in ancient times who would not permit the inscriptions to record she but he came or he the ruler conquered fool whatever concerns me my womanhood is not less lofty than the crown i was a woman ere i became queen the people prostrate themselves before my empty litters but when in my youth i wandered in disguise with antony through the city streets and visited some scene of merry-making while the men gazed admiringly at me and we heard voices behind us murmur a handsome couple i returned home full of joy and pride but there was something greater still for the woman to learn when the heart in the breast of the queen forgot throne and sceptre and in the hours consecrated to eros tasted joys known to womanhood alone how can you men who only command and desire understand the happiness of sacrifice i am a woman my birth does not exalt me above any feeling of my sex and what i now ask is not as queen but as woman if that is the case alexis answered with his hand upon his heart you impose silence upon me for were i to confess to the woman cleopatra what agitates my soul 
i should be guilty of a double crime i would violate a promise and betray the friend who confided his noble wife to my protection now the darkness is becoming too dense for me replied cleopatra raising her head with repellent pride or if i choose to raise the veil i must point out to you the barriers which surround the queen replied the syrian with an obsequious bow there you behold the fact it is an impossibility to separate the woman from the princess so far as i am concerned i do not wish to anger the former against the presumptuous adorer and i desire to yield to the latter the obedience which is her due therefore i entreat you to forget the armlet and its many painful associations and pass to the consideration of other matters perhaps the fair barine will voluntarily confess everything and even add how she managed to ensnare the amiable son of the greatest of men and the most admirable of mothers the young king caesarion cleopatra's eyes flashed more brightly and she angrily exclaimed i found the boy just now as though he were possessed by demons he was ready to tear the bandage from his wound if he were refused the woman whom he loved a magic potion was the first thought and his tutor of course attributes everything to magic arts charmian on the contrary declares that his visits annoyed and even alarmed barine nothing except a rigid investigation can throw light upon this subject we will await the imperator's return do you think that he will again seek the singer you are his most trusted confidant if you desire his best good and care for my favour drop your hesitation and answer this question the syrian assumed the manner of a man who had reached a decision and answered firmly certainly he will unless you prevent him the simplest way would be well to inform him as soon as he lands that she is no longer to be found i should be especially happy to receive this commission from my royal son and do you think it would dim the light of your moon a little were he to seek her here in vain as surely as that the contrary would be the case if he were always as gratefully aware of the peerless brilliancy of his son as it deserves helios suffers no other orb to appear so long as he adorns the heavens his lustre quenches all the rest let my son so decree and barine's little star will vanish enough i know your aim now but a human life is no small thing and this woman too is the child of a mother we must consider earnestly consider whether our purpose cannot be gained without proceeding to extremes this must be done with zeal and a kindly intention but i now when the fate of this country my own and the children's is hanging in the balance when i have not fifteen minutes at my command and there is no end of writing and consulting i can waste no time on such matters the reflective mind must be permitted to use its mighty wings unimpeded cried the syrian eagerly leave the settlement of minor matters to trustworthy friends here they were interrupted by the introducer who announced the eunuch mardian he had come on business which spite of the late hour permitted no delay alexis accompanied the queen to the tablinum where they found the eunuch a slave attended him carrying a pouch filled with letters which had just been brought by two messengers from syria among them were some which must be answered without delay the keeper of the seal and the exegetus were also waiting their late visit was due to the necessity of holding a conference in relation to the measures to be adopted to calm the excited citizens all the galleys which had escaped from the battle had entered the harbour the day before wreathed with garlands as if a great victory had been won loud acclamations greeted them yet tidings of the defeated actium spread with the swiftness of the wind crowds were now gathering threatening demonstrations had been made in front of the sebasteum and on the square of the serapium the troops had been compelled to interfere and blood had flowed there lay the letters zeno remarked that more papers conferring authority were required for the work on the canal and the exegetus earnestly besought definite instruction it is much much murmured cleopatra then drawing herself up to her full height she exclaimed well then to work but alexis did not permit her to do this at once humbly advancing as she took her seat at the large writing-table he whispered and with all this must my royal mistress devote time and thought to the destroyer of her peace to disturb your majesty with this trifle is a crime yet it must be committed 
for should the affair remain unheeded longer the trickling rivulet may become a mountain torrent here cleopatra whose glance had just rested upon a fateful letter from king herod turned her face half towards her husband's favourite exclaiming curtly with glowing cheeks presently then she glanced rapidly over the letter pushed it excitedly aside and dismissed the waiting syrian with the impatient words attend to the trial and the rest no injustice but no untimely mildness i will look into this unpleasant matter myself before the imperator returns and the authority asked the syrian with another low bow you have it if you need a written one apply to zeno we will discuss the affair further at some less busy hour the syrian retired but cleopatra turned to the eunuch and flushed with emotion cried pointing to the king of judea's letter did you ever witness baser ingratitude the rats think the ship is sinking and it is time to leave it if we succeed in keeping above water they will return in swarms and this must 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 be done for the sake of this beloved country and her independence then the children the children all our powers must now be taxed every expedient must be remembered and used we will hammer each feeble hope until it becomes the strong steel of certainty we will transform night into day the canal will save the fleet mark antony will find in africa panarius scarpus with untouched loyal legions the gladiators are faithful to us we can easily make them ours and my brain is seething with other plans but first we will attend to the alexandrians no violence this exclamation was followed by order after order and the promise that if necessary she would show herself to the people the exegetus was filled with admiration as he received the clear sagacious directions after he had retired with his companions the queen again turned to the regent saying we did wisely to make the people happy at first with tidings of victory the unexpected news of terrible disaster might have led them to some unprecedented deed of madness disappointment is a more common pain for which less powerful remedies will suffice besides many things could be arranged ere they knew that i was here how much we have accomplished already mardian but i have not even granted myself the joy of seeing my children i was forced to defer the pleasure of the companionship of my oldest friends even archibius when he comes again he will be admitted i have given the order he knows rome thoroughly i must hear his opinion of pending negotiations she shivered as she spoke and pressing her hand upon her brow exclaimed octavianus victor cleopatra vanquished i who was everything to caesar beseeching mercy from his heir i a petitioner to octavia's brother yet no no there are still a hundred chances of avoiding the horrible doom but whoever wishes to compel the field to bear fruits must dig sturdily draw the buckets from the well plough and sow the seed to work then to work when antony returns he must find all things ready the first success will restore his lost energy i glanced through yonder letter while talking with the exegetus now i will dictate the answer so she sat reading writing and dictating listening answering and giving orders until the east brightened with the approach of dawn the morning star grew pale and the regent utterly exhausted entreated her to consider her own health and his years and permit him a few hours rest then she too allowed herself to be led into her darkened chamber and this time a friendly dreamless slumber closed her weary eyes and held her captive until roused by the loud shouts of the multitude who had heard of the queen's return and flocked to lochius end of chapter twelve chapter thirteen part one of cleopatra by georg ebers translated by mary j safford this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirteen during these hours of rest iris and charmian had watched in turn beside cleopatra when she rose the younger attendant rendered her the necessary services she was to devote herself to her mistress until the evening for her companion who now stood in her way was not to return earlier before charmian left she had seen that her apartments in which barine since the queen had placed her in her charge had been a welcome guest were carefully watched the commander of the macedonian guard who years before had vainly sought her favour and finally had become the most loyal of her friends had promised to keep them closely 
yet iris knew how to profit by her mistress's sleep and the absence of her aunt she had learned that she would be shut out of her apartments and therefore from barine also ere any step could be taken against the prisoner she must first arrange the necessary preliminaries with alexis the failure of her expectation of seeing her rival trampled in the dust had transformed her jealous resentment into hatred and though she was her niece she even transferred a portion of it to charmian who had placed herself between her and her victim she had sent for the syrian but he too had gone to rest at a late hour and kept her waiting a long time the reception which the impatient girl bestowed was therefore by no means cordial but her manner soon grew more friendly first alexis boasted of having induced the queen to commit barine's fate to him if he should try her at noon and find her guilty there was nothing to prevent him from compelling her to drink the poison cup or having her strangled before evening but the matter would be dangerous because the singer's friends were numerous and by no means powerless yet in the depths of her heart cleopatra desired nothing more ardently than to rid herself of her dangerous rival but he knew the great ones of the earth if he acted energetically and brought matters to a speedy close the queen to avoid evil gossip would burden him with her own act antony's mood could not be predicted and the syrian's weal or woe depended on his favour besides the execution of the singer at the last adonis festival might have a dangerous effect upon the people of alexandria they were already greatly excited and his brother who knew them said that some were overwhelmed with sorrow and others ready in their fury to rise in a bloody rebellion everything was to be feared from this rabble but philostratus understood how to persuade them to many things and alexis had just secured his aid alexis had really succeeded in the work of reconciliation during the orator's married life with barine she had forbidden her brother-in-law the house and her husband had quarrelled with the brother who sought his wife but after the latter had risen to a high place in antony's favour and been loaded with gold by his lavish hand philostratus had again approached him to claim his share of the new wealth and the source from which alexis drew flowed so abundantly that his favourite did not find it difficult to give both men were as unprincipled as they were lavish and experience taught them that base natures always have at their disposal a plank with which to bridge chasms if it is of gold it will be crossed the more speedily such was the case here and of late it had become specially firm for each needed the other's aid alexis loved barine while philostratus no longer cared for her on the other hand he hated dion with so ardent a thirst for revenge that to obtain it he would have resigned even the hope of fresh gains the humiliation inflicted upon him by the arrogant macedonian noble and the derision which through his efforts had been heaped upon him haunted him like importunate pursuers and he felt that he could only rid himself of them with the source of his disgrace without his brother's aid he would have been content to assail dion with his slandering tongue with his powerful assistance he could inflict a heavier injury upon him perhaps even rob him of liberty and life they had just made an agreement by which philostratus pledged himself to reconcile the populace to any punishment that might be inflicted upon barine and alexis promised to help his brother take a bloody vengeance upon dion the macedonian barine's death could be of no service to alexis the sight of her beauty had fired his heart a second time and he was resolved to make her his own in the dungeon perhaps by torture she should be forced to grasp his helping hand all this would permit no delay everything must be done before the return of antony who was daily expected alexis's lavish patron had made him so rich that he could bear to lose his favour for the sake of this object even without it he could maintain a household with royal magnificence in some city of his syrian home on receiving the favourite's assurance that he would remove barine from charmian's protection on the morrow iris became more gracious she could make no serious objection to his statement that the new trial might not it is true end in a sentence of death but the verdict would probably be transportation to the mines or something of the sort 
then alexis cautiously tested iris's feelings towards his brother's mortal foe they were hostile yet when the favourite intimated that he too ought to be given up to justice she showed so much hesitation that alexis stopped abruptly and turned the conversation upon barine here she promised assistance with her former eager zeal and it was settled that the arrest should be made the following morning during the hours of charmian's attendance upon the queen iris had valuable counsel to offer she was familiar with one of the prisons whose doors she had opened to many a hapless mortal whose disappearance in her opinion might be of service to the queen she had deemed it a duty aided by the keeper of the seal to anticipate her mistress in cases where her kind heart would have found it difficult to pronounce a severe sentence and cleopatra had permitted it though without commendation or praise what happened within its walls thanks to the silence of the warder never passed beyond the portals if barine cursed her life there she would still fare better than she iris who during the past few nights had been on the brink of despair whenever she thought of the man who had disdained her love and abandoned her for another as the syrian held out his hand to take leave she asked bluntly and dion he cannot be set free was the reply for he loves barine nay the fool was on the eve of leading her home to his beautiful palace as its mistress is that true really true asked iris whose cheeks and lips lost every tinge of colour though she succeeded in maintaining her composure he confessed it yesterday in a letter to his uncle the keeper of the seal in which he entreated him to do his utmost for his chosen bride whom he would never resign but zeno has no liking for this niece do you wish to see the letter then of course he cannot be set at liberty replied iris and there was additional shrillness in her voice he will do everything in his power for the woman he loves and that is much far more than you who are half a stranger here suspect the macedonian families stand by each other he is a member of the council the bands of the ephebi will support him to a man and the populace he lately spoiled the game of your brother who was acting for me in a way he was finally dragged out of the basin of the fountain dripping with water and overwhelmed with shame for that very reason his mouth must be closed iris nodded assent but after a short pause she exclaimed angrily i will help you to silence him but not for ever do you hear theodotus's saying about the dead dogs which do not bite brought no blessing to any one who followed it there are other ways of getting rid of this man a bird saying that you were not unfriendly to him a bird then it was probably an owl which cannot see in the daylight his worst enemy your brother would probably sacrifice himself for his welfare sooner than i then i shall begin to feel sympathy for this dion i saw recently that your compassion surpassed mine death is not the hardest punishment is that the cause of this gracious respite perhaps so but there are other matters to be considered here first the condition of the times everything is tottering even the royal power which a short time ago was a wall which concealed many things and afforded shelter from every assault then dion himself i have already numbered those who will support him since the defeat at actium the queen can no longer exclaim to that many-headed monster the people you must but i entreat the others the first considerations are enough but may i be permitted to know what my wise friend has awarded to the hapless wight from whom she withdrew her favour first imprisonment here at lochius he has stained his hands with the blood of caesarium the king of kings that is high treason even in the eyes of the people try to obtain the order for the arrest this very day whenever i can disturb the queen with such matters not for my sake but to save her from injury away with everything which can cloud her intellect in these decisive days first away with barine who spoiled her return home and then let us take care of the man who would be capable for this woman's sake of causing an insurrection in alexandria the great cares associated with the state and the throne are hers for the minor ones of the toilet and the heart i will provide here she was interrupted by one of cleopatra's waiting-maids the queen had awakened and iris hastened to her post as she passed charmian's apartments and saw two handsome soldiers belonging to the macedonian bodyguard pacing to and fro on duty before them 
her face darkened it was against her alone that charmian was protecting barine she had been harshly reproved by the older woman on account of the artist's daughter who had been the source of so many incidents which had caused her pain and iris regretted that she had ever confided to her aunt her love for dion but no matter what might happen the upas tree whence emanated all these tortures anxieties and vexations must be rooted out stricken from the ranks of the living ere she entered the queen's ante-room she had mentally pronounced sentence of death on her enemy her inventive brain was now busy in devising means to induce the syrian to undertake its execution if this stone of offence was removed it would again be possible to live in harmony with charmian dion would be free and then much as he had wounded her she would defend him from the hatred of philostratus and his brother she entered the queen's presence with a lighter heart the death of a condemned person had long since ceased to move her deeply while rendering the first services to her mistress who had been much refreshed by her sleep her face grew brighter and brighter for cleopatra voluntarily told her that she was glad to have her attendance and not be constantly annoyed by the same disagreeable matter which must soon be settled in fact charmian conscious that no one else at court would have ventured to do so had never grown weary spite of many a rebuff of pleading barine's cause until the day before cleopatra in a sudden fit of anger had commanded her not to mention the mischief-maker again when charmian soon after requested permission to let iris take her place the following day the queen already regretted the harsh reproof she had given her friend and while cordially granting the desired leave begged her to attribute her angry impatience to the cares which burdened her and when you show me your kind faithful face again she concluded you will have remembered that a true friend withholds from an unhappy woman whom she loves whatever will shadow more deeply her already clouded life this barine's very name sounds like a jeer at the composure i maintain with so much difficulty i do not wish to hear it again the words were uttered in a tone so affectionate and winning that charmian's vexation melted like ice in the sun yet she left the queen's presence anxious and troubled for ere she quitted the room cleopatra remarked that she had committed the singer's affairs to alexis she was now doubly eager to obtain a day's freedom for she knew the unprincipled favourite's feelings towards the young beauty and longed to discuss with archibius the best means of guarding her from the worst perils when at a late hour she went to rest she was served by the nubian maid who had accompanied her to the court from her parents home she came from the cataract where she had been bought when the family of alpius accompanied the child cleopatra to the island of philae anukis was given to Darmian, who at the time was just entering womanhood as the first servant who was her sole property and she had proved so clever skilful apt to learn and faithful that her mistress took her as her personal attendant to the palace charmian's warm unselfish love for the queen was equalled by anukis's devotion to the mistress who had long since made her free and had become so strongly attached to her that the nubian's interests were little less regarded than her own her sound keen judgment and natural wit had gained a certain renown in the palace and as cleopatra often condescended to rouse her to an apt answer antony had done so too and since the slight crook in the back which she had from childhood had grown into a hump he gave her the name of isopian the female aesop all the queen's attendants now used it and though others of lower rank did the same she permitted it though her ready wit would have supplied her tongue with a retort sharp enough to respond to any word which displeased her but she knew the life and fables of aesop who had also once been a slave and deemed it an honour to be compared with him when charmian had left cleopatra and sought her chamber she found barine sound asleep but anukis was awaiting her and her mistress told her with what deep anxiety for barine she had quitted the presence of the queen she knew that the nubian was fond of the young matron whom in her childhood she had carried in her arms and whose father leonax had often jested with her the maid had watched her career with much interest and while barine had been her mistress's guest her efforts to amuse and soothe her were unceasing she had gone every morning to berenike to ask tidings of dion's health and always brought favourable news anukis knew philostratus and his brother too and as she liked antony who jested with her so kindly she grieved to see 
an unprincipled fellow like alexis his chief confidant she knew the plots with which the syrian had persecuted barine and when charmian told her that the queen had committed the young beauty's fate to this man's keeping her dark face grew fairly livid but she forced herself to conceal the terror which the news inspired her mistress was also aware what this choice meant to barine but anukis would have thought it wrong to disturb charmian's sleep by revealing her own distress it was fortunate that she was going early the next morning to seek the aid of archibius whom anukis believed to be the wisest of men but this by no means soothed her she knew the fable of the lion and the mouse which had been told in her home long before the time of the author for whom she was nicknamed and already more than once she had been in a position to render far greater and more powerful persons an important service to soothe charmian to sleep and turn her thoughts in another direction she told her about dion whom she had found much better that day how tenderly he seemed to love barine and how touchingly patient and worthy of her father the daughter of leonax had been after her mistress had fallen asleep she went to the hall where spite of the late hour she expected to meet some of the servants sure of being greeted as a welcome guest when a short time later alexis's body-slave appeared she filled his wine-cup sat down by his side and tried with all the powers at her command to win his confidence and so well did the elderly nubian succeed that marcius a handsome young ligurian after she had gone declared that aesopian's jokes and stories were enough to bring the dead to life and it was as pleasant to talk seriously with the brown-skinned monster as to dally with a fair-haired sweetheart after charmian had left the palace the following morning anukis again sought marcius and learned from him for what purpose and at what hour iris had summoned alexis his master was continually whispering with the languishing macedonian when anukis returned barine seemed troubled because she brought no tidings from her mother and dion but the nubian entreated her to have patience and gave her some books and a spindle that she might have occupation in her solitude she anukis must go to the kitchen because she had heard yesterday that the cook had bought some mushrooms which might be poisonous she knew the fungi and wanted to see them then passing into charmian's chamber she glided through the corridor which connected the apartments of cleopatra's confidential attendants and slipped into iris's room when alexis entered she was concealed behind one of the hangings which covered the walls of the reception-room after the syrian had retired and iris had been called away anukis returned to barine and said that the mushrooms had really been poisonous and of the deadliest species they had been cooked and she must go out to seek an antidote since a precious human life might be at stake barine would not wish to keep her go said the latter kindly but if you are the old obliging isopian you won't object to going a little farther and inquiring at the house near the paneum garden added anukis that was already settled longing is also a poison for a loving heart and its antidote is good news with these laughing words she left her favourite but as soon as she was out of doors her black brow became lined with earnest thought and she stood pondering a long time at last she went to the bruchium to hire a donkey to ride to canopus where she hoped to find archibius it was difficult to reach the nearest stand for a great crowd had assembled on the quay between the lochius and the corner of the muses and groups of the common people sailors and slaves were constantly flocking hither but she at last forced her way to the spot and while the driver was helping her to mount the animal she had chosen she asked what had attracted the throng and he answered they are tearing down the house of the old museum fungus didymus how can that be cried the startled woman the good old man good repeated the driver scornfully he's a traitor who has caused all the trouble philostratus the brother of the great alexis a friend of mark antony told us so he wanted to prove it so it must be true hear the shouts and how the stones are flying yes yes his granddaughter and her lover set an ambush for the king caesarion they would have killed him but the watch interfered and now he lies wounded on his couch if mighty isis does not lend her aid the young prince's life will soon be over then turning to the donkey he dealt him two severe blows on the right and left haunches shouting hi gray it does one good to hear that royal backs have room for the cudgel too meanwhile the nubian was hesitating whether she should not first turn the donkey to the right and seek didymus but barine was threatened by greater peril 
and her life was of more value than the welfare of the aged pair this decided the question and she rode forward the donkey and his driver did their best but they came too late for in the little palace at canopus anukis learned from the porter that archibius had gone to the city with his old friend timogenes the historian who lived in rome and seemed to have come to alexandria as an envoy charmian too had been here but also failed to find the master of the house and followed him evil tidings which owing to the loss of time involved might prove fatal if the donkey had only been swifter true archibius's stable was full of fine animals but who was she that she should presume to use them yet she had gained something which rendered her the equal of many who were born free and occupied a higher station the reputation for trustworthiness and wisdom and relying upon this she told the faithful old steward as far as possible what was at stake and soon after he himself took her both mounted on swift mules to the city and the paneum garden he chose the nearest road thither through the gate of the sun and the canopic way usually at this hour it was crowded with people but to-day few persons were astir all the idlers had thronged to the bruchium and the harbour to see the returning ships of the vanquished fleet hear something new witness the demonstrations of joy the sacrifices and processions and if fortune favoured meet the queen and relieve their overflowing hearts by acclamations when the carriage turned towards the left and approached the paneum progress for the first time became difficult a dense crowd had gathered around the hill on whose summit the sanctuary of pan dominated the spacious garden anukis's eye perceived the tall figure of philostratus was the mischief-maker everywhere this time he seemed to encounter opposition for loud shouts interrupted his words just as the carriage passed he pointed to the row of houses in which the widow of leonax lived but violent resistance followed the gesture anukis perceived what restrained the crowd for as the equipage approached its destination a body of armed youths stopped it their finely formed limbs steeled by the training of the palestra and the raven chestnut and golden locks floating around their well-shaped heads were indeed beautiful they were a band of the ephebi formerly commanded by archibius and to whose leadership more recently dion had been elected the youths had heard what had occurred that imprisonment perhaps even worse disaster threatened him at any other time it would scarcely have been possible to oppose the decree of the government and guard their imperilled friend but in these dark days the rulers must deal with them though they were loyal to the queen and had resolved spite of her defeat to support her cause as soon as she needed them they would not suffer dion to be punished for a crime which in their eyes was an honour their determination to protect him grew more eager with every vexatious delay on the part of the city council to deal with a matter which concerned one of their own body they had not yet decided whether to demand a full pardon or only a mild sentence for the man who had wounded the king of kings the son of the sovereign moreover the quiet caesarian still subject to his tutor had not understood how to win the favour of the ephebi the weakling never appeared in the palestra which even the great mark antony did not disdain to visit the latter had more than once given the youths assembled there proofs of his giant strength and his son antyllus also frequently shared their exercises dion had merely dealt caesarion with his clenched fist one of the blows which every one must encounter in the arena philotus of amphissa the pupil of didymus had been the first to inform them of the attack and with fiery zeal had used his utmost power to atone for the wrong done to his master's granddaughter his appeal had roused the most eager sympathy the ephebi believed themselves strong enough to defend their friend against any one and if the worst should come they knew they would be sustained by the council the exegetus the captain of the guard a brave macedonian who had once been an ornament of their own band and the numerous clients of dion and his family there was not a single weakling among them they had already found an opportunity to prove this for though they had arrived too late to protect didymus's property from injury they had checked the fury of the mob whose passions philostratus had aroused and forced back the crowd whom the syrian led to barine's dwelling to devote it to the same fate another equipage was already standing before the door of berenike's house one of the carriages which were always at the disposal of the queen's officials when anukis left archibius's vehicle 
had some of alexis's myrmidons arrived or was he himself on the way to examine dion or even arrest him the driver like all the palace servants knew anukis and she learned from him that he had brought gorgias the architect anukis had never met the letter though during the rebuilding of caesarion's apartments she had often seen him and heard much of him among other things that dion's beautiful palace was his work he was a friend of the wounded man so she need not fear him when she entered the atrium she heard that berenike had gone out to drive with archibius and his roman friend the leech had forbidden his patient to see many visitors no one had been admitted except gorgias and one of dion's freedmen but time pressed people of the same rank and disposition understand one another the old porter and the nubian were both loyal to their employers and moreover were natives of the same country so it required only a few words to persuade the doorkeeper to conduct her without delay to the bedside of the wounded man the freedman a tall weather-beaten greybeard simply clad who looked like a pilot was waiting outside the sick-room he had not yet been admitted to dion's presence but this did not appear to vex him for he stood leaning quietly against the wall beside the door gazing at the broad-brimmed sailor's hat which he was slowly turning in his hands scarcely had dion heard anukis's name when an eager letter come in reached her ears through the half-open door the nubian waited to be summoned but her dark face must have showed distinctly that something important and urgent had brought her here for the wounded man added to his first words of greeting the expression of a fear that she had no good news her reply was an eager nod of assent accompanied by a doubtful glance at gorgias and dion now curtly told the architect the name of the newcomer and assured her that his friend might hear everything even the greatest secret anukis uttered a sigh of relief and then in a tone of the most earnest warning poured forth the story of the impending danger she would not be satisfied when he spoke of the ephebi who were ready to defend him and the council which would make the cause of one of its members its own but entreated him to seek some safe place of refuge no matter where for powers against whom no resistance would avail were stretching their hands towards him even this statement however proved useless for dion was convinced that the influence of his uncle the keeper of the seal would guard him from any serious danger then anukis resolved to confess what she had overheard but she told the story without mentioning barine and the peril threatening her also finally with all the warmth of a really anxious heart she entreated him to heed her warning even while she was still speaking the friends exchanged significant glances but scarcely had the last words fallen from her lips when the giant figure of the freedman passed through the door which had remained open you here pyrrhus cried the wounded man kindly yes master it is i replied the stalwart fellow twirling his sailor hat still faster listening isn't exactly my trade and i don't usually enter your presence uninvited but i couldn't help hearing what came through the door and the croaking of the old raven drew me in i wish you had heard more cheerful things replied dion but the brown-skinned bird of ill omen usually sings pleasant songs and they all come from a faithful heart but when my silent pyrrhus opens his mouth so far something important must surely follow and you can speak freely in her presence the sailor cleared his throat gripped his coarse felt hat in his sinewy hands and said in such a tremulous embarrassed tone that his heavy chin quivered and his voice sometimes faltered if the woman is to be trusted you must leave here master and seek some safe hiding-place i came to offer one on my way i heard your name it was said that you had wounded the queen's son and it might cost you your life then i thought no no not that so long as pyrrhus lives who taught his young master dion to use the oars and to set his first sail pyrrhus and his family why repeat what we both know well enough from my first boat and the land on our island to the liberty you bestowed upon us we owe everything to your father and to you and a blessing has rested upon your gift and our labour and what is mine is yours no more words are needed you know our cliff beyond the alveus steganus north of the great harbour the isle of serpents it is quickly gained by any one who knows the course through the water but is as inaccessible to others as the moon and stars people are afraid of the mere name though we rid the island of the vermin long ago my boys dionysus dionychus and dionychus they all have dion in their name are waiting in the fish-market and when it grows dusk 
here the wounded man interrupted the speaker by holding out his hand and thanking him warmly for his fidelity and kindness though he refused the well-meant invitation he admitted that he knew no safer hiding-place than the cliff surrounded by fluttering seagulls where pyrrhus lived with his family and earned abundant support by fishing and serving as a pilot but anxiety concerning his future wife prevented his leaving the city End of chapter thirteen part one chapter thirteen part two of cleopatra by georg ebers translated by mary j safford this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirteen part two the freedmen however gave him no rest he represented how quickly the harbour could be reached from his island that fish were brought thence from it daily and he would therefore always have news of what was passing his sons were like him and never used any unnecessary words talking did not suit them the women of the household rarely left the island so long as it sheltered their beloved guest they should not set foot away from it if occasion should require the master could be in alexandria again quickly enough to put anything right this suggestion pleased the architect who joined in the conversation to urge the freedman's request but dion for barine's sake obstinately refused until anukis who had long been anxious to go in pursuit of archibius thought it time to give her opinion go with the man my lord she cried i know what i know i will tell our barine of your faithful resolution but how can she show her gratitude for it if you are a dead man this question and the information which followed it turned the scale and as soon as dion had consented to accompany the freedmen the nubian prepared to continue her errands but the wounded man detained her to give many messages for barine and then she was stopped by the architect who thought he had found in her the right assistant for numerous plans he had in his mind he had returned early that morning from hieroampolis where with other members of his profession he had inspected the newly constructed waterway the result of the first investigation had been unfavourable to the verge of discouragement and in behalf of the others he had gone to the queen to persuade her to give up the enterprise which though so full of promise was impracticable in the short time at their disposal he had travelled all night and was received as soon as cleopatra rose from her couch he had driven from the lochias in the carriage placed at his disposal because he had business at the arsenal and various points where building was going on in order to inspect the wall erected for antony on the coma and the temple of isis at the corner of the muses to which cleopatra desired to add a new building but scarcely had he quitted the bruchium when he was detained by the crowd assailing the house of didymus with beams and rams and at the same time keeping off the ephebi who had attacked them he had forced his way through the raging mob to aid the old couple and their granddaughter the slave phyrix had been busily preparing the boats which lay moored in the harbour of the sea-washed estate but gorgias had found it difficult to persuade the grey-haired philosopher to go with him and his family to the shore he was ready to face the enraged rioters and though it should cost his life cry out that they were shamefully deceived and were staining themselves with a disgraceful crime not until the architect represented that it was unworthy of a didymus to expose to bestial violence a life on which helpless women and the whole world to whom his writings were guide-posts to the realms of truth possessed a claim could he be induced to yield nevertheless the sage and his relatives almost fell into the hands of the furious rabble for didymus would not depart until he had saved this that and the other precious book till the number reached twenty or thirty 
besides his old deaf wife who usually submitted quietly when her defective hearing prevented her comprehension of many things insisted upon knowing what was occurring she ordered everybody who came near her to explain what had happened thus detaining her granddaughter helena who was trying to save the most valuable articles in the dwelling so the departure was delayed and only the brave defence of young philotus didymus's assistant and some of the ephebi who joined him enabled them to escape unharmed the scythian guards which at last put a stop to the frantic rage of the deluded populace arrived too late to prevent the destruction of the house but they saved philotus and the other youths from the fists and stones of the rabble when the boats had gone farther out into the harbour the question of finding a home for the philosopher and his family was discussed berenike's house was also threatened and the rules of the museum prevented the reception of women five servants had accompanied the family and none of didymus's learned friends had room for so many guests when the old man and helena began to enumerate the lodgings of which they could think gorgias interposed with an entreaty that they would come to his house he had inherited the dwelling from his father it was very large and spacious almost empty and they could reach it speedily as it stood on the seashore north of the forum the fugitives would be entirely at liberty there since he had work on hand which would permit him to spend no time under his own roof except at night he soon overcame the trivial objections made by the philosopher and fifteen minutes after they had left the corner of the muses he was permitted to open the door of his house to his guests and he did so with genuine pleasure the old housekeeper and the grey-haired steward who had been in his father's service looked surprised but worked zealously after gorgias had confided the visitors to their charge the pressure of business forbade his fulfilling the duties of host in his own person didymus and his family had reason to be grateful and when the old sage found in the large library which the architect placed at his disposal many excellent books and among them some of his own he ceased his restless pacing to and fro and forced himself to settle down then he remembered that by the advice of a friend he had placed his property in the keeping of a reliable banker and though life still seemed dark grey it no longer looked as black as before gorgias briefly related all this to the nubian and dion added that she would find archibius with his roman friend at the house of berenike's brother the philosopher arius like himself the latter was suffering from an injury inflicted by a reckless trick of antyllus barine's mother was there also so anukis could inform them of the fate of didymus and his brother and tell them that he dion intended to leave her house and the city an hour after sunset but interrupted gorgias no one not even your hostess berenike and her brother must know your destination you look as if you could keep a secret woman though she owes her nickname aesopian to her nimble tongue replied dion but this tongue is like the little silver fish with scarlet spots in the palace garden said anukis they dart to and fro nimbly enough but as soon as danger threatens they keep as quiet in the water as though they were nailed fast and by mighty isis we have no lack of peril in these trying times would you like to see the lady berenike and the others before your departure berenike yes but the sons of arius they are fine fellows would be wise to keep aloof from this house to-day yes indeed the architect chimed in it will be prudent for their father too to seek some hiding-place he is too closely connected with octavianus it may indeed happen that the queen will desire to make use of him in that case he may be able to aid barine who is his sister's child timogenes too who comes from rome as a mediator may have some influence 
the same thoughts entered my poor brain also said anukis i am now going to show the gentleman the danger which threatens her and if i succeed yet what could a serving woman of my appearance accomplish still my house is nearer to the brink of the stream than the dwelling of most others and if i fling in a loaf perhaps the current will bear it to the majestic sea wise isopion cried dion but the worthy maid-servant shrugged her crooked shoulders saying we needn't be free-born to find pleasure in what is right and if being wise means using one's brains to think with the intention of promoting right and justice you can always call me so then you will start after sundown with these words she was about to leave the room but the architect who had watched her every movement had formed a plan and begged her to follow him when they reached the next room he asked for a faithful account of barine and the dangers threatening her after consulting her as if she were an equal he held out his hand in farewell saying if it is possible to bring her to the temple of isis unseen these clouds may scatter i shall be in the sanctuary of the goddess from the first hour after sunset i have some measurements to take there when you say you know that the immortals will have pity on the innocent woman whom they have led to the verge of the abyss perhaps you may be right it seems as if matters here were combining in a way which would be apt to rob the story-teller of his listener's faith after isopion had gone gorgias returned to dion's room and asked the freedman to be ready with his boat at a place on the shore which he carefully described the friends were again alone gorgias had his hands full of work but he could not help expressing his surprise at the calm bearing which dion maintained you behave as if you were going to an oyster supper at canopus he said shaking his head as though perplexed by some incomprehensible problem what else would you have me do asked the macedonian the vivid imagination of you artists shows you the future according to your own varying moods if you hope you transform a pleasant garden into the elysian fields if you fear anything you behold in a burning roof the conflagration of a world we from whose cradle the muse was absent who use only sober reason to provide for the welfare of the household and the state as well as for our own see facts as they are and treat them like figures in a sum i know that barine is in danger that might drive me frantic but beyond her i see archibius and charmian spreading their protecting wings over her head i perceive the fear of my faction including the museum of the council of which i am a member of my clients and the conditions of the times which precludes arousing the wrath of the citizens the product which results from the correct addition of all these known quantities will be correct interrupted his friend so long as the most incalculable of all factors passion does not blend with them the passion of a woman and the queen belongs to the sex which is certainly more powerful in that domain granted but as soon as mark antony returns it will be proved that her jealousy was needless we will hope so it is only the misled deceived abused cleopatra whom i fear for she herself is matchless in divine goodness the charm by which she ensnares hearts is indescribable and the iron power of her intellect i tell you dion friend friend was the laughing interruption how high your wishes soar for three years i have kept an account of the conflagrations in your heart i believe we had reached seventeen but this last one is equal to two folly cried gorgias in an irritated tone may not a man admire what is magnificent wonderful unique she is all these things just now how long ago is it she appeared before me in a radiance of beauty which should have made you shade both eyes yet you have been speaking so warmly of your young guest her loving caution her gentle calmness in the midst of peril do you suppose i wish to recall a single syllable the architect indignantly broke in helena has no peer among the maidens of alexandria but the other cleopatra 
is elevated in her divine majesty above all ordinary mortals you might spare me and yourself that scornful curl of the lip had she gazed into your face with those tearful sorrowful eyes as she did into mine and spoken of her misery you would have gone through fire and water hand in hand with me for her sake i am not a man who is easily moved and since my father's death the only tears i have seen have been shed by others but when she talked of the mausoleum i was to build for her because fate she knew not how soon might force her to seek refuge in the arms of death my calmness vanished then when she cumbered me among the friends on whom she could rely and held out her hand a matchless hand oh laugh if you choose i felt i know not how and kneeling at her feet i kissed it it was wet with my tears i am not ashamed of this emotion and my lips seem consecrated since they touched the little white hand which spoke a language of its own and stands before my eyes wherever i gaze pushing back his thick locks from his brow as he spoke he shook his head as though dissatisfied with himself and in an altered tone hurriedly continued but this is a time ill-suited for such ebullitions of feeling i mentioned the mausoleum whose erection the queen desires she will see the first hasty sketch to-morrow it is already before my mind's eye she wished to have it adjoined the temple of isis her goddess i proposed the great sanctuary in the rakotis quarter but she objected she wished to have it close to the palace at lochias she had thought of the temple at the corner of the muses but the house occupied by didymus stood in the way of a larger structure if this were removed it would be possible to carry the street through the old man's garden perhaps even to the seashore and we should have had space for a gigantic edifice and still left room for a fine garden but we had learned how the philosopher loved his family estate the queen is unwilling to use violence towards the old man she is just and perhaps other reasons of which i am ignorant influence her so i promised to look for another site though i saw how much she desired to have her tomb connected with the sanctuary of her favourite goddess then i have already told the clever brown witch then the immortals divinity fate or whatever we call the power which guides the world in our lives according to eternal laws and its own mysterious omnipotent will permitted a rascally deed from which i think may come deliverance for you and a source of pleasure to the queen in these days of trial man man where will this new passion lead you the horses are stamping impatiently outside duty summons the most faithful of men and he stands like a prophet indulging in mysterious sayings whose meaning and purport spite of your calm calculations of existing circumstances will soon seem no less wonderful to you than to me whose unruly artist nature according to your opinion is playing me a trick retorted the architect now listen to this explanation didymus's house will be occupied at once by my workmen but i shall examine the lower rooms of the temple of isis i have with me a document requiring obedience to my orders cleopatra herself laid the plans before me even the secret portion showing the course of the subterranean chambers it will cast some light upon my mysterious sayings if i bear you away from the enemy through one of the secret corridors they were right in concealing from you by how slender a thread spite of the power of your example in mathematics the sword hangs above your head now that i see a possibility of removing it i can show it to you to-morrow you would have fallen without hope of rescue into the hands of cruel foes and been shamefully abandoned by your own weak uncle had not the most implacable of all your enemies permitted himself the infamous pleasure of laying hands on an old man's house and the queen in consequence of an agitating message had the idea suggested of building her own mausoleum the corridor here he lowered his voice of which i spoke leads to the sea at a spot close beside didymus's garden and through it i will guide you and if possible barine also to the shore this could be accomplished in the usual way only by the greatest risk 
if we use the passage we can reach a dark place on the strand unseen and unless some special misfortune pursues us our flight will be unnoticed the litters and your tottering gait would betray everything if we were to enter the boat anywhere else in the great harbour and we sensible folk refuse to believe in miracles cried dion holding out his wan hand to the architect how shall i thank you you dear clever most loyal of friends to your male friends though your heart is so faithless to fair ones add that malicious speech to the former ones for which i now crave your pardon what you intend to accomplish for barine and me gives you a right to do and say to me whatever ill you choose all the rest of my life anxiety for her would surely have bound me to this house and the city when the time came to make the escape for without her my life would now be valueless but when i think that she might follow me to pyrrhus's cliff don't flatter yourself with this hope pleaded gorgias serious obstacles may interpose i am to have another talk with the nubian later with no offence to others i believe her advice will be the best she knows how matters stand with the lofty and yet herself belongs to the lowly besides through charmian the way to the queen lies open and nothing which happens at court escapes her notice she showed me that we must consider barine's delivery to alexis a piece of good fortune how easily jealousy might have led to a fatal crime one whose wish promptly becomes action unless she curbs the undue zeal of her living tools those on whom fate inflicts so many blows rarely are in haste to spare others would the anxieties which weigh upon her like mountains interpose between the queen and the jealous rancour which is too petty for her great soul what is great or petty to the heart of a loving woman asked dion in any case you will do what you can to remove barine from the power of the enraged princess i know gorgias pressed his friend's hand closely then yielding to a sudden impulse kissed him on the forehead and hurried to the door on the threshold a faint moan from the wounded man stopped him would he be strong enough to follow the long passage leading to the sea dion protested that he confidently expected to do so but his deeply flushed face betrayed that the fever which had once been conquered had returned gorgias's eyes sought the floor in deep thought many sick persons were borne to the temple in the hope of cure so dion's appearance would cause no special surprise on the other hand to have strangers carry him through the passage seemed perilous he himself was strong but even the strongest person would have found it impossible to support the heavy burden of a grown man to the sea for the gallery was low and of considerable length still if necessary he would try with the comforting exclamation if your strength does not suffice another way will be found he took his leave gave barine's maid and the wounded man's body-slave the necessary directions commanded the doorkeeper to admit no one save the physician and stepped into the open air a little band of ephebi were pacing to and fro before the house others had flung themselves down in an open space surrounded by shrubbery in the paneum garden and were drinking the choice wine which dion's cellarer by his orders had brought and was pouring out for the crowd it was an animated scene for the clients of the sufferer who after expressing their sympathy had been dismissed by the porter and bedizened girls had joined the youths there was no lack of jests and laughter and when some pretty young mother or female slave passed by leading children with whom the garden was a favourite playground many a merry word was exchanged gorgias waved his hands gaily to the youths pleased with the cheerfulness with which the brave fellows transformed duty into a festival and many raised their wine cups shouting a joyous io and evo to drink the health of the famous artist who not long ago had been one of themselves the others were led by a slender youth the student philotus from amphissa didymus's assistant whom the architect a few days before had helped to liberate from the demons of wine 
even while gorgias was beckoning to him from the two-wheeled chariot the thought entered his mind that yonder handsome youth who had so deeply wronged barine and dion would be the very person to help carry his friend through the low-roofed passage to the sea if philotus was the person gorgias believed him to be he would deem it a special favour to make amends for his crime to those whom he had injured and he was not mistaken for after the youth had taken a solemn oath not to betray the secret to any one the architect asked him to aid in dion's rescue philotus overflowing with joyful gratitude protested his willingness to do so and promised to wait at the appointed spot in the temple of isis at the time mentioned End of chapter thirteen part two